and thank you for uh, including me here tonight. I'm going to talk about what senior housing is today for those that are new to the senior housing side. I'll say that briefly. I'll talk about what specifically is happening that's going to require the space to be reimagined, which was at least one or two words I heard earlier, uh, and what it means for the uh, ecosystem of innovators. Because another word that I heard a lot was around collaboration, and for the next for the world that we would all like to happen, it's going to involve a lot of collaboration. Before we begin, I want to start off by saying that a lot of what senior housing is today was, uh, was created in the 80s. So some of the leading brands that you may have heard of, Sunrise, uh, Ericsson, uh, Holiday, uh, uh, independent living provider, they, uh, they, they were started in 81, 83, and 87, respectively. Well, in those days, uh, a few of us may have been using this thing. No, some of you may not, but um, so we were designing, or the industry was designing for a consumer that was excited about, yeah, <laughs> we'll get there, uh, was uh, uh, excited about what a Sony Walkman was all about, right? And this was innovation, this was uh, an alternative to the ghetto, ghetto Blaster, which some of us may have had as well. Well, you know, of course, the world we're in now um, is, is closer to this world, although this world is, uh, is now passe to some degree. And so you think about what, what was involved in that design and thinking and the marketing of it, and it speaks to the fact that a lot of the stuff that's built today in senior housing still has the sa same operating ethos and building design of a concept really 30 years old. So just, I just want to get a couple basics so people have a context. I think it'll lend itself to some of the later uh, presentations. So here's sort of the continuum of, of senior housing as it exists today, and, and senior housing generally uh, connotes the real estate plus the services. In senior housing and care, and that's independent living, assisted living, and, and nursing care. And to, to put a scope behind sort of the magnitude of it, we have about 15% of the population that's 75 and older resides somewhere in senior housing, okay? That means 85% is outside of this world. And it was already mentioned, a lot of people would prefer to be outside that world. Uh, for independent living, assisted living, those are primarily private pay, whereas, whereas nursing care is primarily some sort of government reimbursement or, or insurance. And, and so in terms of the penetration rate of how many people as a private pay consumer uh, are in some sort of senior housing, it's actually closer to about 7.5%, a number that has largely stayed static which we'll get into. So think of it as a sub-segment of the space, the, the, the nursing care piece is largely on the Medicaid, so lower income side. And one of the reasons why the penetration rate is, is generally low is because it's expensive, which we all know, but I just want to make sure in terms of basis of understanding. You know, you'll see that uh, before you add in real meaningful care, you know, the price can range anywhere from $3,500 to uh, to north of $5,000, I think in DC is one of the more expensive areas as an example. This is a slide recently from the Wall Street Journal. And it can be often misleading because you have different uh, care rates for people as, as they have uh, greater needs. And so what might be quoted as a base price of called $3,500, when you add more care into it, it can approach you know $10,000 in cases in urban markets, especially in dementia care, for example. So it raises a question as we think about how to have innovative solutions, how do we make them affordable? And because, again, only about 7% 7, 7 of those in the private pay space are choosing senior housing today. So why will it change? I'm gonna, I'm gonna list four reasons why I think it's gonna change and why it's important us, for us to be aware of. First one is consumers are gonna look for greater value. You know, one, one of the words I shared was sort of consumer delight. How can we give people something that they can afford and they're also excited about it. Who's heard of net promoter score? Just raise your hand. Okay, so a handful of people. It's, it's simple, a simple term I'd encourage all of you to remember, maybe tweet, I guess. Um, the idea is it's a very simple uh, mechanism to show whether you're sort of excited about engaging in a project or not. So, you know, you shop on Amazon, for example, uh, you're more likely to buy something it's, if it's uniformly a four or something or five than a three. That's what this concept sort of gets to. And there was a study that was recently done in the senior housing landscape that asked seniors and their families, 
you know, how, how did you think about the value proposition of what you got for the care? And people didn't respond too favorably. This is uh, several hundred homes, uh, private pay, independent living, and assisted living. And what they found is for every two and a half people, for every one person that was enthusiastic, that would have rated a five in terms of the value proposition, there were over, over two and a half people that felt neutral or worse about what the value was. So you sort of hear that and you think, gosh, that's, that's an opportunity for people to come in with, with perhaps better ideas at a different value price point. That's worse than all 29 industries that this group Satmetrics tracks. So it's worse than your cable provider, worse than your uh, energy provider, you know, I don't know, maybe after these storms some people, people feel differently. Um, another reason is this, is this issue around a preference for over, over institutional living. And, and you know, th there's a bunch of terms that are out there. This, the, the, or surveys, they're more or less asked every year with sort of the same response, which is around 90% of people would prefer to sort of age in a home that they're comfortable with as opposed to moving to something that's more institutional. And, and as a result, um, I think it's going to force us to think differently about what that environment looks like in the future. And one of the things that has happened is preference to aging in place has impacted not only uh, outside senior housing, but it's happened inside senior housing. So people now, or those that are sort of in the field, have seen the average age go up now for people entering senior housing materially, and then for those that are in traditionally lower care levels, they're staying there longer and having care delivered to them. So even some of the technologies that we'll hear about later tonight, they may have an application within senior housing in lower care levels. And in that model, one of the justifications is that the price point can be lower. Uh, and it helps people avoid moving to more something more institutional. So the third reason I want to highlight, which is a, I think a really important one, there was a, um, there's a, a paper that was written by ULI uh, just a month ago, and it's, I, I highly recommend it. It's a great paper. It goes into the generational differences for, 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 for senior housing, just this whole segment. And it speaks to the Walkman effect. It says you know, a lot of stuff that was out there was built for the greatest generation. When in fact, now we're seeing the silent generation, and then of, uh, of course, the, the leading e edge boomers come in the segment, you know, they're 66, the, uh, the silent generation are 84 at the moment. But it's not just the fact that they're older, it's just people are gonna have different expectations, different preferences, some of the research that Katie and Steven alluded to earlier. And so as a, role, as a result, it's gonna be fascinating to watch what happens, because the silent generation, they tend to have buying behavior more akin to the, uh, the boomer generation than the greatest generation. You know, they're focused more on, on value than just cost. They're, they're less trusting of brands. You know, they want more sort of optionality. So we, we may get some sort of sense of how this unfolds right now because the average age of people moving into senior housing is about 84, 85 right now. So, you know, we'll see real time sort of how that works itself out. And, and the fourth reason I want to highlight is really around affordability. You know, it's, this, I think this downturn has impacted all of us, and, and seniors as well, or those in the 65 plus cohort. So you have a combination of people being less wealthy, as well as just more fearful of the future. You know, there was some uh, data from the Fed Reserve which talked about, uh, I think from 07 to 2010, you know, a real meaningful drop, close to 40% in net worth. Now a lot of that was housing related, a lot of that, hit the, uh, those who are 25 to 35 of the hardest, but it hit, hit seniors too, and especially those that are leading, uh, leading edge boomer side where they had uh, second mortgages that they pulled out for other things, they, they got hit by this. Like, and, and, and they're pulling back and they're less likely to get as aggressive in the future. And so you'll see, I think, in buying behavior, people think about that. Converse, as well as the fact that People are more fearful based on some studies now what the future is going to look like. I and mean, one study talked about how uh, the 65 plus population was, was more uh, optimistic in 09 right after the troubles in 08, expecting a bounce back. And uh, you're probably not as convinced of that now. And so thinking of more of a longer horizon and some of the ARP work that's been done out there as well, speeding to the fact that people are expecting to live longer. And as a result, expecting to work longer. So what does that all mean? Well, what it means, and I think it's appropriate for this audience, it means that we need to collaborate. We need to find new and different ways to delight the consumer and think more about like their life, 
like some of the themes that Katie and Stephen talked about earlier. And so rather than starting with the Sony Walkman and trying to figure out ways to sort of add iTunes to Sony Walkman, which is probably pretty dif difficult to do, maybe we're better off starting with new blueprint and really trying to assess what should be part of that blueprint and what should not be, see what sticks, what doesn't, you know, have some capacity for, uh, for risk in that process. And what we're gonna find, I believe, is a couple things. You're gonna find groups today, the providers, the people that are already in the space of senior housing. And they've been raised to think a certain way. And they've been really successful for a long time. But the world's changed. And the way that they think, the way that they operate these communities, the way they've redeveloped them, they're gonna need help to figure it out. And some of the innovations that you all and others will come up with will be a threat to some of those groups. Some of them may be partnership opportunities. So it's important, you know, as, is to think sort of thoughtfully about where are those collaboration points and, the, and those touch points where partnerships can happen, because those providers are going to need help, and they're they're going to need they're going to be motivate motivation around innovation, and they're going to need help sort of executing on it. On the other side, for innovators yourself, like I said, if you have a technology, think thoughtfully about how senior housing can be a key channel for what you're trying to do. You know, because that can be a great way to test out different things, and certain providers more than others are more likely to, uh, to be good avenues for that. I've already had a couple conversations tonight where that's sort of in, in play at the moment. I can say that not everyone thinks the world and senior housing is, is, is in the Walkman, um, but I think the people that see it most clearly may be the people not in the industry. And therein lies, I think, part of the opportunity with the sort of aging 2.0 framework is people looking at this from a different set of experiences and saying, wow, we can do better. So I just encourage all of us as we see these different opportunities, let's find ways to really, really challenge the existing model. You know, even though as it may be developing in different, different countries, we should be mindful about not taking the same model as it is today and just dropping another place. What can we do to have a step function of sort of what's possible? So that's really all I have here to sort of kick it off. Um, if people have any, uh, any questions, be happy to answer one or two. Yes. Uh, what sort of new technologies do you see in the housing area for seniors? What, what, what new technologies do I see? Not in terms of construction, but in terms of helping them. What, what are the type of technologies or, or do you see being incorporated in housing? <coughs> yeah, what, so the, I think the question is, what sort of technology do you see inside of housing to sort of help people? And I, and I think it's interesting. A lot of the technology has been around, and we'll hear about some of it tonight. Um, one of the challenges has been actually getting it to market and getting people to, uh, to have it work in their business model, to get people to change their, um, their process flow in ways that sort of work. But as examples of some of the technology, you know, you hear right, one category would be the modern, modern technology, which we're gonna hear about you know, tonight, where aren't there ways that people can be more in control you know, of their own care or their caregivers, their adult children could be more informed of what's actually happening in ways that keep them healthy longer avert more institutional care, because one of the challenges about institutional care is often it's time hard to get out of that. Once you're there, you're sort of there, typically. So that would be sort of one category. And just one other I'd like to highlight is with all these services, and again, Stephen and, and Katie spoke to this, with all these different services out there, it'd be great if there's ways with technology to help coordinate those services. So you're more in control. There's not all these separate silos. Um, and that, that, I'm sure that will happen over time. Yeah. You know, I, I do. I think that, um, so yeah, the, the, the question is, what role do you see universal design uh, having in, in sort of senior housing? And um, it's a, going back to Sony Walkman, a lot of stuff that was built 30 years or still the same design didn't, didn't really think about universal design. I'll give, you, I'll give you an example. So the continuing care retirement communities, which is our, a subset of that first slide we looked at, um, the expectation was that people would, would move in a progression from independent living to assisted living to skilled nursing. Well, that's not really what's happening now. And that's not what consumers want. So as a result, the universal design becomes all that more important because we need to contemplate designs 
that allow you to stay in an environment for a very prolonged period of time, you know, sort of God willing. So what I would say is it's universal design plus. What, what principles can we take of universal design and maybe with modern technologies and other things that are out there, think about where this is headed with a mind towards sort of flexibility because things will continue to change and so you don't want to be too much in stuck in a particular model. But examples could be maybe there's walls that you can take down real easily. Right? Maybe there's, there's things that you can add. Maybe you don't, uh, certain things that can help as you need more care, those are easy bolt-ins, but you don't have them when you first move in. So I think there's a lot of thought that architects, but not just architects, just the whole collaborative team thinking about that consumer where we can sort of improve what's possible. So I think it plays a big role over time.